good morning, Northgate family. It's so good to have you all here with us today. Welcome home. We are back. It's been about something like 84 days since we've had our last service. So there's a reason to rejoice this morning. Amen. And those of you on Facebook, we want to welcome you guys this morning. And we just say join in with us and from your living rooms or wherever you may be today. And let's worship Jesus together because we family. Amen. Come on, guys. Let's go. The power of sin and darkness, love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. He takes the whole earth, holy thunder, he lives his breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. See the amazing grace. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, who brings our chaos? Come on. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the open the son and daughter? The king of glory, the king above all kings. Who rules a nation with truth and justice? Shines like the sun, and all of his brilliance. King of glory, king above all kings. This is, this is amazing grace. This is a family love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cause. I sing for all that you've done for me. Yes, Jesus. Sing worthy. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy, oh worthy. This is amazing grace. Yes, Jesus. The man in love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, see it again. This is, this is amazing grace. This is amazing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Yes, Lord. Amen. Holy cow, it's so good to have people here. I feel like there's a stadium full of people in here. You know, in the midst of chaos and all that we have been through, we're not out of it yet, but it's getting better. God has been with us through the whole thing, and 
You know, you may have lost a job or you've lost a family member or, or you know, stuff's happened and you just don't understand why. You know, storms are just temporary. Storms are temporary. And then God will meet us on the other side. He's even walking with us through the whole thing. And so that's just so encouraging to know that God is always going to be there. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to worship. Jesus. 
us. Lord, you're not dead. Lord, you are alive and you're risen again. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, God, Lord, that you would reveal yourself even more today, God, than ever. It's nothing but the blood, Lord, that has saved us, God. Today we want to remember the Lord in his death. First Sunday of every month here at Northgate, we receive communion. And uh, it's just so good to see people today. <laughs> I, uh, I've i been looking into a camera for about three months. I'm looking into one now. Those of you who are watching uh, online, we're, we're so glad you're with us on Facebook. Um, but um, I feel awkward. I feel awkward with a camera. I think what I'm, I make it up in uh, passion <laughs> for what I'm talking about. But anyway, we're just so glad to have people here today, and we're so glad to have you at home with us. We want you to uh, prepare to receive communion with us. I say it often, but there's a God in heaven who loves us very, very much. 
I don't think we understand how much he loved us. He paid, his son Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice by dying on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of peace, of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I'm going to ask you to remove the top layer and take out the wafer. This is a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. I know you've been doing this at home, and now we get to do this together. But uh, his body was broken for us, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The price he paid was enormous. He said, whenever you take this bread, and whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. So today, Lord Jesus, we remember your death. And we say, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking away our sins. Lord, as we have repented of our sins to you, you've taken those sins away. We now become children of the Most High God. And we spend time today remembering your death. Thank you so much. Lord, you took the bread and you broke it. And you said it represented your body. So today we remember that. Eat if you would. The Bible also tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no remission of sin. His blood was shed. And we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood today. We are so undeserving, oh God. But we receive it today. We remember your shed blood today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that just covers us, oh God. Lord, we can't make it without you, God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, not flowing down. Hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. As grace flows down, it covers me. It covers me. It covers me. One more 
time, amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing love. Amazing love. Now flowing. Now flowing down with hands and feet. Hands and feet. That would nail to the trees. Grace flows down. Grace flows down to cover. Come on, it covers me. It covers me.
the weak you have made strong, oh God. For we could not have done this in the last 84 days without you, God. I don't know how people that don't even know you do it, Jesus. But Lord, you give us hope, you give us peace. You give us strength through all this, oh God. And your hand is right on our hand, walking right through the storm with us, Jesus. And you're even on the other side of it waiting for us, Lord. Jesus, we just thank you for your blood this morning that was shed, that was we remembered today. God, we thank you for loving on us, sacrificing for us, oh God. We worship your name today, God. We exalt your name today. Hallelujah, Lord. You are worthy to be praised, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Sing it one more time. Christ alone. In Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. You know what? It's good to be in the house. Amen? Amen. It's good to be in the house. Go ahead and just find somebody. Give them a chicken wing or a high five, air high five. But it's good to be in the house. Amen. Good morning, Northgate. I know we're all happy to see each other, but since we're socially distancing, it should be easier to get back to our seats. <laughs> or it should be. I'll say I should be. Well, I have a few announcements for you all this morning, but before I announce anything, I do want to just take a moment to thank you all for your continued giving through this time where we weren't actually physically in the building, but you've still been honoring God with your, with your finances through tithes and offerings, so we just want to thank you for that. And the buckets will be available in the back if you do want to pass it or put it in there on your way out. And then I just got a few announcements for you. Uh, first of all, my, my favorite announcement of the day is Outbreak Youth is going to be coming back this week. Uh, junior high, you're still going to be meeting on, on Tuesday nights at 7. And high school, we'll meet on Wednesday night at 7. Um, so we're excited to have you guys back. Uh, we're going to be shortening our service to one hour, uh, but it's still going to be a great time, and I'm excited that we're going to be with you guys. Um, also on Wednesday nights, Pastor Greg is going to continue his Bible study on the book of Philippians on Facebook Live, so you can tune in to him. Uh, he's been doing awesome with all the, the studies that he's been doing, and I've been tuning in, but now that I'm back to youth group, I won't be, So, but it's there for me later. And then lastly, we have men's Bible study. They're meeting on Saturdays at 9 a.m., and it's going to be here. This week was the first week, and we had six or seven guys. Is that right, Pastor David? Yeah, six or seven guys that came. So we have, plen we have room for 43 more people, so you guys can come and, and, and join us in that study. And um, that's all we've got for you today. Pastor Greg's going to come up and share. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, we're going to actually do one more thing. Uh, the graduate, we have some students who graduated from middle school to high school and then high school graduates as well. So we're going to take some time to honor them uh, because of social distancing and time. We're, they're not going to come up to the stage, but we're going to put a picture of each student on the screen. So first up, we have Arlie Sanchez. She's here. So Arlie graduated high school. If you see any of these students after service, feel free to congratulate them. Uh, and then next we have Blair Atkinson. He's not here today, but if you see him whenever, uh, you can go ahead and congratulate him as well. Uh, Anthony Sabalos, he's also not here this morning, but you can congratulate him when you see him. And then we have Sherrod Rayford. He's here. He's in the corner there. So if you see him, thank or congratulate him. And then we have some middle school students. We have Emily Muncy. She's not here. I think she's on vacation still. 
but if you see her, uh, we have Ma Madison Adams. I don't see her, but I see her dad. You can congratulate him. <laughs> we have Valencia, Valencia Guerra Sema. She's also not here. And we have Martin Molina. I think that's it. So congratulations to all of you who have graduated and moved up into high school. It's a super awesome thing that you've done, and now you get to come see us in high school or college and career with Pastor Leslie. And then we do have some gifts, but they're not here with us today. Uh, yeah, um, middle school, you'll still see Pastor Shannon and Pastor Levy. You'll get your gifts then. And high school, you'll see myself and Pastor Ariel on Wednesday, and you'll get your gifts on that night too. Thank you, Pastor Maverick. Awesome. Give him a hand. Oh, so good to be with you. Now, we got a group of people next door, too, because we kind of exceeded our limit just not that much. But, uh, but we have some people next door, and so give them a hand for next door. Would you? <laughs> we know you're with, and we know you're at home watching us also uh, on Facebook. Take your Bibles, if you would, and let's turn to John chapter 6. We're going to be looking at uh, verse 35. Well, we're going to look at a, a number of verses in that chapter. Um, let's go to the scripture. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Wow. What a, what a tremendous word from Jesus himself. So what did Jesus mean when he said, I am the bread of life? Did he mean that suddenly be, he became a, a piece of rye toast? No. Uh, I believe what he was saying was that he alone was able to satisfy our deepest needs. Do you hear me? Jesus alone is able to satisfy our deepest needs. You see, bread in Jesus' day was a staple diet, especially for those in the low income area. Bread. Did you know that bread in uh, 1920 was 12 cents a loaf? 12 cents a loaf. 1930, it dropped to 5 cents a loaf. <laughs> 1982, 55 cents a loaf. 2002, $2.12 a loaf. And then uh, 2012, it was two dollars and forty-five cents. Now, I, I even—that's as far as I could find as far as figures. But I even uh, checked around to see what the most expensive loaf of bread is in the entire world. Now, m many of the places I looked at, it, it was—it was. It, it, there were figures dealing with the euro and stuff like that, and you almost had to double that and all that kind of stuff. But uh, on average, the average size loaf of the average price of loaf of bread around the world is like eighty dollars. Now I don't know what those people are eating over there, but uh, eighty bucks for a loaf of bread. Now in Jesus' day, it was made into flat cakes of wheat or uh, wheat or barley flour. And grain was ground at a mill, and it was baked, and it was pretty simple. But when we look at the background of this story that we're sharing today, we find that Jesus had just finished feeding 5,000 people on a hillside. I got, to be a, I got to be in September. I was there where uh, he fed the 5,000. It was just kind of... Uh, Amazing thing to be there and see where all the people must have sat. Now, it says, the Bible says 5,000, but they only counted men during that time. I'm sorry, ladies, children, they only counted men. So we're probably looking at somewhere between 15,000, 17,000 people sitting on that hillside and um, being fed. When Jesus left uh, that, that, that place after he fed them, the Bible tells us that a crowd followed him. 
Why did the crowd follow him? Because he just fulfilled a physical need that they had. He fed them when they were hungry. Back then, there were no soup kitchens. There were no food ministries. There were no government programs. When you didn't have it, you just went without it. It's hard for us to imagine, huh? This really was a big deal. These were hungry, desperate people. And now their hopes were being elevated. Here comes this guy. He says he's the Messiah. He says he's the Son of God. And he is feeding us. Just maybe with Jesus in control, this can be an ongoing occurrence. I mean, I would have thought that. I would have hoped that. If I spend days going without food and all of a sudden Jesus shows up and I get to eat, I'm going to be pretty excited about that. But listen to what Jesus said to them in verses 26 and 27. He said, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be concerned about perishable things like food. I'm going to say that again. Don't be concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. He's drawing a line here. Now we all know that Jesus was a good teacher. He was a miracle worker. He was also a great example of how to live life. But his mission on earth was to satisfy not our physical needs, although he was concerned about that. His mission on earth was to satisfy our deepest spiritual need. I contend today that every human being has a God-sized hole in their heart that can only be filled by Jesus, by His Spirit. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, He's saying that I and only I alone can satisfy you. Your deepest spiritual needs. Does anyone here know where Jesus was born? Nobody. Bethlehem. Well, finally, we found somebody who knows where Jesus was born. <laughs> you know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. I wonder if God was trying to tell us something about that. Way back then. Listen to the bold statement that Jesus uses in verse 35. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The nerve of him making that kind of statement. See, Jesus declares to be the end of hunger and thirst. The search is over. If your heart has been feeling like there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing in life. I'm just thirsty for truth. I'm hungry for truth. I'm hungry for a God who created me in the first place and I've been out of touch with Him. I hunger for Him. The search is over. The longing that drives us all to work and sweat and strive for more and more, for, for more and more provision, it's over in Christ. Once we, once we find Jesus, that need, that, that, that God-sized hole is met. 
Jesus is the end of longing if we just come to him for our satisfaction. We need to come to him. In verses 47 through 50, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. He says, your ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. The people in Jesus' day, they wanted him to provide just the same way Moses did for their ancestors in the desert. They wanted manna. I don't think they wanted the real, necessarily real manna, but they wanted that daily provision which manna provided for them. They wanted more of the feeding of the 5,000 type of miracles. They wanted to end life as they knew it, having to struggle all the time, never having enough. But now they were with a Messiah who was meeting even their physical needs. But Jesus uses that to say, you have a bigger need than physical need. You have a much bigger need. You have a need to be reconciled with God. Jesus hears the desperate cry for help in these people. He knew, though, what they really needed. And he begins to compare God's plan with their plan. Their plan was, Jesus, stay with us from now until eternity, and everything will be okay. But God's plan is, you trust in Jesus, and everything will be okay. So let me ask you today, how much is enough? How much is enough? What will it take to satisfy your appetite? You ever sit down at a great looking meal and say, I can't wait to dig into this? I am so hungry. I'm just so hungry. And I eat, and I eat, and I eat. until I'm more than satisfied. And then what happens? I end up paying for it later. How many know what I'm talking about? Why do we spend so much time worrying about how much is enough? When all along, just like the manna in the desert, Jesus wants to, and this is point number one in your notes, Jesus wants to be the supernatural provision for all needs. He wants, he wants to be the supernatural provision for all of our needs. Now in Exodus chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, goes like this. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The, the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. They said, what is it? You know, that's what manna is. What is it? They said, what is it? And they meant manna. Manna means, what is it? What is it? If you've never seen it before, and all of a sudden you go out there and you see these flakes on the ground, and it became, and it was like little bread. They said, what is it? They had no idea what it was, and Moses told them, this is the food the Lord has given you to eat. Now understand, they're in the desert. There's two point some million people with them wandering in the desert. Sure, they have, they have some livestock and things like that, but it wasn't enough. God says, I'll take care of you. So he provides for them manna. You know, I think that many of us have fallen into the thinking that abundant life comes through having Jesus and then maybe a little something-something on the side. 
You know what I mean? Like, Jesus isn't really enough. But I mean, I'm glad I have Jesus, but I need that other little something on the side. In other words, Jesus is great, but I need something else to fall back on. Or I need to supplement Jesus with worldly wealth. Or some religious duty that I can do. A food ministry that I can go take part in. I, I, I know Jesus is good and I love Jesus, but I, I, just, I just need something else. I just need a little bit more to carry me through. It's not what Jesus is saying here. He said, I want to provide all that you need. See, we always try to add to the definition of what satisfies. But in the days of the children in the desert, it was simply manna. It was simply manna. The gift from heaven. It was all that they needed. In 2 Peter 1.3, Peter says, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. God has given us everything we need to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. You know, for all of us who are struggling so hard to please God and to live a godly life, I think sometimes we're trying so hard to do as opposed to be. Just relax and be what God has called you to. Let His divine power radiate through your life and be who he's called you to be. Quit struggling at doing to try to please him. Doing will come natural after we learn to be. That's going to help you to become all that he has for you. See, his provision for you is much more than stuff that you need. He's promised power for your life, for your spiritual life. The provision of material things is really no big deal to God. Did you know that? The provision of material things is no big deal to God. The hard part is, does our heart want to know Him better? That's the hard part. Does our heart want to know Him better? He can continue to drop manna from the sky for 40 years or quail so thick that the people could hardly walk or even water from a rock when they complained about not having any water all Moses did was go out there and strike a rock and they had more water than they, than they, could, they could ever imagine we should never ever question God's ability to provide. God can, those, are, those are easy things for God to do. It's our heart that's difficult. Kind of reminds me of the two criminals that were on the cross. One of the criminals said, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you prove it? Get us all down from here. Hey, Jesus, provide for us. If you really are who you say you are, provide for us. Get us off these crosses. Get us out of this mess that we're in. How many of you find yourself saying that to the Lord every now and then? God, I'm in a mess. Get me out of this mess. When all along God is saying to us, I want to provide what your heart is missing. 
God can do all that other stuff. But it's your heart that's important to him. See, the other thief, you know what he did? He saw the kingdom. He saw what was real. He understood the condition of his own heart. And he opened it up to God. That's why Jesus could look at, look at him while he hung on the cross. And he said to that other thief, he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Why? You see the kingdom. See, the disciples didn't, didn't even get it at that time. The religious leaders of the day, they didn't get it. But a criminal got it. A criminal got it. He gets the kingdom. He realizes that it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. He knows that the king is going to die. And that his kingdom is going to be established through his death. But see, even in the desert, manna became a source, number two, became a source of constant complaining. The manna. Numbers 11, chap uh, chapter 11, verses 4 and 6. Then the foreign rabble, in other words, these were troublemakers, who were traveling with the Israelites, they began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they complained. They, they exclaimed, we remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. We had all the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic that we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this stinking manna. Over and over every day. They didn't say stinking. I added that. But let me ask you. You ever find yourself complaining about Jesus and Christianity the way the children of Israel did about the manna? Sadly, many of us do. For some reason, complaining always seems to justify the complainer. It makes us feel better. It makes us feel right. Think about it. God is raining down total nutrition provision from heaven. And he does the same for 40 years. You, you know that after they crossed into the, over the Jordan into the Canaan land, no more manna? There wasn't a need for it anymore. But while they're in the desert, while they were in need, they needed manna. They needed food from heaven. They needed quail. When they started complaining they didn't have enough, that all they had was manna, God says, all right, I'll give you, I'll give you quail. And it, and it was so thick, it came up to their knees. When they needed water, Moses strikes a rock. They needed shade, God gives them a cloud. They needed warmth, God gives them a cloud of fire. Daily provision. But if all you were eating was manna every day, how many would complain? Now, be honest, you're in church. That's right. No matter how healthy your body was, from a totally ordained nutritional diet from God, we would still complain. And you know what? I think God knew we would complain. I think He, he knows us real well. He knew we would complain. So you figure, you know, God, why, why don't you just mix it up a little bit? How about a Domino's pizza every once in a while? How about a, how, how about a, a, a Taco Bell double cheese burrito and beans and all that? I, I, that'd be nice once in a while. 
keeping everybody happy. See, this, this type of complaining was a, a type that was to come in the, in, the, in the future. But let me tell you, there's only one supply. Only one source. There's only one way to really get your needs met. See, we don't like that. We like all paths lead to God. But they don't. All the arguments about how great the variety was in Egypt. Did they forget they were slaves? Come on. I mean, we had all this stuff in Egypt. You were also slaves. You were also mistreated. You were also brutalized. Did you forget that? See... Egypt was a place of slavery, but the road to freedom was manna, and only manna. See, there's no other way. Jesus is the only bread of life. And just like the manna in the desert, thirdly on your notes, Jesus has become a source of daily provision. A source of daily provision. Every day the manna had to be collected in the amount that was needed for that day. And for that day only. Look how Jesus taught his disciples when he said this in Matthew 6, 10 and 11. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us Today, everybody say that. Give us today the food we need. Give us today. He uses the word today. Not only does God want to meet our physical needs every day, but more importantly, we need a face to face with the bread of heaven every day. I remember when Facebook, when Facebook first came out, and those of you watching on Facebook, you know that, and some of you know, that I've done my fair share of preaching against Facebook. And then I had to repent when we had to start using it. To, <clears throat> I, I understand the reason it, had to, it was developed in the first place. But people used to say to me, I, you know, it's on Facebook. You'll see. Well, we'll go check it out on Facebook. Facebook. I said, I'm not, I'm not into Facebook. You know, m my wife got on Facebook and my girls go on Facebook. I just don't. It's, it, it was always a time waster for me. I mean, I had people con contact me. Hey, Greg, how you doing? I'm sitting here. I hope you're not watching. But uh, I'm, I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here in the park uh, eating a cheese sandwich and putting on my socks. And I go, that's it. Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to waste my time with that. I used to tell people, used to tell me, you know, you go on Facebook, and I said, look, I have enough trouble getting my face in the book every day. That's what I want. I want to be in the book. I want to have a face-to-face -face with Jesus every day, who is the bread of life, who is the provider of everything that I need. If we're going to make it in this life, my brothers and sisters, and worship team, if you'll come back to the platform. If we are going to make it in this life, once a week, for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, well, however long is it, it is that we're here, once, the, once a week is not going to cut it. It's just not going to cut it. We need a face-to-face -face with Jesus, the giver of life, the bread of life. And notice he says, our daily bread, not just my daily bread. Our daily bread. See, we're not alone in this, in needing provision from God. It's, it, it, it's, it's not like we're done if our needs are met. 
We are the body of Christ. This goes beyond our personal satisfaction. It's about our neighbor. Through this epidemic and pandemic that we've been going through, it's been a joy of my heart to watch the people that I pastor care for each other. It's been so exciting. People going out of their way to help other people, run errands for them, make sure they had enough food in the house. There have been people who said, you know, I like to cook, and I was making something, and I thought, I, ne I need to go give some to this person, that person. Maybe they were elderly, and they needed some help. I've heard one story after another of that happening, and it just absolutely blesses my heart. So it's about all of us together. We need to declare today that Jesus and Jesus alone is our daily bread. Stand with me, would you? This is our day I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. is my daily bread this is my daily bread your very word spoken without you and I'm desperate for you let's sing it and I I'm desperate for you and I lost without you Lord Jesus I just pray today that you would make that we would make you our daily bread every day that when we wake up in the morning just like the children of Israel Israel would go out and collect their bread that we would wake up and seek your face, the daily bread. And we would say, supply our every need. First, spiritually, O oh God, meet the need of my heart. Fill that God-sized hole in my heart. Lord, for those today who would say, I need to have Jesus come into my heart for the very first time, I pray that today they would just say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I need you. Be my Lord. I believe you died on the cross for me. Come into my life, Jesus. And Lord, I know that as you fulfill our spiritual needs, all the other stuff that we need to live, God, you can provide. That's not a big deal for you. We put our trust and our hope in you. Your word says, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. 
So from the very depths of our soul, we hope in you, O God. You are our hope. You are our provider, O God. We declare there's no one like you. You can provide jobs. You can provide food. You can provide clothing. You can provide uh, education. Lord, you can provide all those things for us, oh God. That's not hard for you. But Lord, we want to take care of first things first. And God, we say to you, fill that hole in our hearts, oh God. And I... I'm desperate for you. And I I'm lost without you. And I desperate for you and I I'm lost without you well I gotta tell you I woke up this morning I couldn't get here fast enough just to see everybody. It's been three months. I've been starving. <laughs> Thank you so much for your love and support for me, my family, the church, all of, all of our pastors. Thank you so much. Just so good to have you all here today. So good to see you. Someday, I told, my mask is down there, but I I told somebody someday when all this is over, I think we'll have a big mask burning service. <laughs> Those of you at home, uh, I know you'll be able to join us someday when you can. Friends around the world that are watching. Uh, we have friends all over the world that are watching us today. Uh, thank you for being a part of us. We love you. Have a great, great day. See you next week. Amen. I'm desperate for you And I I'm lost without you And I without you.